By the way, you may have noticed I am not wearing a coat and tie today and I can't look this direction. That's because I have an extraordinarily painful stiff neck and so I am, uh, first of all, like way too much painkiller stuff. Uh, the second thing is uh, I will not be having office hours today. So if I say goofy things during the lecture, uh, just keep in mind that I'm kind of foggy. And the other thing is even though none of you ever come to see me during my office hours, I won't be there today. So just in case that this was the day, then yeah, sorry about that. Okay, any questions before we get started? Okay, so let's, and I, I picked an example that actually had some difficulty to it this time. We've got Down Under Boomerang considering a three-year expansion project. By the way, this is number two on your practice for Chapter 8. Considering a three-year expansion project that requires an initial fixed asset investment of $2.46 million. The fixed asset will be depreciated straight line to zero over its three-year tax life. Wait a minute. This is not the one that I wanted. Wait a minute. Look at this. It says, after which time it will be worthless, but then it, down here it says it will have a market value of 300000 Does that sound like a typo? What I want you to do is go ahead and mentally scratch out the after which time it will be worthless, because we can't do that, right? Okay, so back to the story. Um, we've got... So we've got uh, an investment of uh, networking capital of 220000 so we're going to have that additionally. Um, they've given us information on sales and costs. Do the costs include depreciation here? No, no. And they give us the market value at the end. Okay, remember, when we're going to do this kind of analysis, what we're looking for is the cash flow from assets, and we're going to break that down into OCF, uh, which is, what does OCF stand for? Operating cash flow, what does NCS stand for? Net capital spending, very good. What does NWC stand for? Networking capital. What's the little triangle mean? Change. Change, very good. Okay, so this is a three year project. How many years would we actually have data for? Yeah, we're going to have four because there's a time zero. But, oh, for shame, he's a little late. At least he shaved. Yeah, we'll give him that. <laughs> and he brought, did you bring enough for everyone? I uh, got half for you. Oh, yeah. Okay. What is that, egg salad? Yeah. That is disgusting. Okay. So, back to the story. Um, we've got time zero is going to be different because we're going to have our investment in networking capital and net capital spending. Uh, and we're going to have the last period that's going to be different because we're going to be getting our networking capital back plus we'll be getting our after tax salvage value. And so that means that years one and two, are, is there any difference between years one and two? No, there's no difference between years one and two, so I really don't need to have a, a column for a, two separate columns. So I'm going to have time, uh, let's see, zero, one and two, and then time three. And I'm going to have OCF. NCS and the change in networking capital. So, let's see. Uh, and then we're going to add, we're going to do our little calculation here, and that's going to give us CFFA. We don't even know OCF yet, but I can tell you what it is at time zero. What do you think it is? How much OCF do we have at time zero? We just built the plant. Today's the day we built the plant. How much operating capital cash flow do we have? Zero. Very good. Peter, speak up there, Mr. Dexheimer. I appreciate it. He was giving me hand signals. There are only two signs that I know in sign language, and this is the only one I can do in public, right? Okay. Back to the story. Um, what about net capital spending at time zero? Any ideas? Yeah, 2.46 million, 2 million, 460 thousand dollars. And then what do they tell us about networking capital at time zero? 
220,000? Yeah. It, so it goes from 0 to 220,000, which makes the change positive 220,000. Now keep in mind that we're going to subtract this and this. So that's why these cash flows look funky, because it's actually money flowing out. Uh, this is money flowing out. Uh, now let's talk about what happens on the other end with this networking capital. We have the assumption that networking capital goes to zero at the end. How am I going to get networking capital back to zero? Out of three. Add it back. How do I? But since we're, uh, this is a positive here, what would this have to be over here? Yeah, it's got to be negative. Okay, so far so good. Um, is there any net capital spending at time one to two, or times one or two? Any? No. Uh, is there any change in networking capital times one to two? No. Nope. Very good. Thank you. So that means that there are two things basically that we have to determine. We have to determine the operating cash flow, which is going to go here and here, and we have to determine our net capital spending at the end. How do we determine our net capital spending at the end? What number are we looking for? What's the name of it? Salvage. Yeah, it's the after-tax salvage value, and it's this formula right here. Now, they tell us that the, the uh, market value of the machine at the end is 300000 so that's going to be market value. They tell us the tax rate, if you look at A, the tax rate is 23%. Um, the only thing we're missing there is book value. What did they tell us though about the book value? They say it's straight line to zero. Zero. So what's the book value at the end? Zero. zero. And so what we're going to do is take let's see, we're going to take our market value at the end, which is three hundred thousand. Minus 0.23 times. Oh shoot! So let's let's do the, 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 the this part first. Market value minus book value. It's just 300,000 minus zero. Can you guys see that? We're going to multiply it by the tax rate. So 300,000 times 0.23 equals. Now I'm going to put a minus on that and then add back my original market value. And that gives me, oh crap, I told you I was going to mess this up today. Okay, so basically, can we agree that 0.77 times 300,000 is our after tax salvage value? Okay, 0.77 times 300,000 equals 231,000. Now. The thing is, this is money flowing back to us, but net capital spending is positive when the money flows out. So what should the sign be on your after-tax salvage value? Negative. So we're looking at minus 231000 bucks here. Okay, so that means the only thing we've got left to do is OCF. Where are we going to start to calculate our operating cash flow? What's the first number I should be throwing out there? EBIT. Say again? EBIT. Okay, how am I going to get to EBIT? What do I start with? Think income statement. What's on top? Yeah, the sales are on top. So they're telling us the sales here are two thousand. Two million. Sorry, two million. That's your sales. And then they tell us the expenses, which we said do not include depreciation. The expenses are how much? For the costs, six hundred ninety-five thousand. Now there's one more thing I need to calculate, or I need to, uh, yeah, I need to calculate and subtract before I can figure out what is my EBIT. What would that thing be? Yeah, depreciation. 
And how much is our depreciation? Well, we've got our 2.46 million. And we're going to divide that by 3, because we're straight line depreciating to 0 over 3 years. And so I think that is $820,000. Is that correct? Is that correct? Okay, very good. Okay, so now we know our depreciation. I'm going to go ahead and write it up in here. Let me erase this since you all know how to do that. And then I'm going to subtract, and that's going to give me my EBIT. Why am I not concerned about subtracting interest? How are we accounting for financing costs in our project? Yeah, the required return. If we included interest here, it would be like double counting the cost of financing. So we're not going to do that. And so all I've got to do is take my sales minus my expenses minus my depreciation, and that's going to give me my EBIT. Two million minus. 695,000 minus 820,000. I get EBIT of 485,000. You get the same number. Okay, good idea. 485,000. Now, how am I going to figure out how much my taxes are? Yeah, we're going to take this number and multiply it by 0.23. I'm getting 111,550. Is that what you get? Now, at this point, I could go ahead and subtract, and that would give me my net income. But do I actually have to do that? to find OCF. No, I've got OCF as uh, EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes. And so it's easy enough for me to say OCF is equal to 485,000. And then we're going to add back the depreciation of 820,000. And then we're going to subtract our taxes of 111 by 50. So when I do, so I'm just going to go ahead and put a minus on this and say plus 820,000 plus 485,000 equals. I'm getting 1,193,450. Now, where does that go over here in my in my table? Year one to two OCF. Year one to two OCF. So I'm going to put in one million one hundred ninety-three thousand uh, four hundred fifty. Where else does it go? Year three. Yeah, in year three. One million one hundred ninety-three thousand four hundred fifty. Boy, the math's real easy here. One million one hundred ninety-three thousand four hundred fifty. Over here. I think this is 2.68 million. Can anyone give me a confirmation on that number? Actually, it's what the answer says, right? So I think we're good to go. Now, one last question then. What is our year three cash flow from assets? And we've got to be careful here because remember, this formula is OCS minus NCS. Oh, actually, this is minus, right? Does that make sense? Because that's cash flow out. So it's OCF minus NCS minus the change in net worth and capital. And so over here on year three, I've got 1,193,450. Uh, and it's minus a minus. What does that do for me? 
becomes a <coughs> plus, right? Plus 220,000 equals. I'm getting 1,644,450. So far, so way you added them. So the formula is actually OCS minus NCS minus networking capital, change in networking capital. And so when I say one million one hundred ninety-three thousand four hundred fifty minus minus two hundred thirty-one thousand, that's actually a plus. Okay. And then we've got minus minus two hundred twenty thousand, and once again, that's actually a plus. And so the math actually turns out to be this number plus these two right here, because minus times a minus is a plus. Does that make sense? Yes? So for the exam, will, you kind of, will the questions kind of be phrased more as like, what is year one cash flow, or will you have to do the whole thing? Okay, so good question. Uh, actually, so what I try to do when I build an exam is to make it to where uh, I can just differentiate the A students from the B students from the C and the D, right? And so what does that tell you? It tells you that for chapter 8, uh, we're going to have uh, roughly six or seven calculations. Maybe one or two of them you'll take all the way to NPV. Um, one of them might be what's the change in networking capital in year three. You know, there will be varying degrees of difficulty. And so if I were you, when I come upon a question like this on the exam, what do I do? Skip it, right? Come back to it at the end when you're ready to, you've got time, you're relaxed. Come back then and nail it. Uh, always, when you get one of these questions, first thing you want to do is go down and read what they're asking. And when uh, they're telling you that networking capital is changing and that uh, you've got a market value of your asset at the end, then uh, you know that's going to be a mess, right? And they're asking for net present value. You skip that. Um, but they might be asking simply, what's the net capital spending in year three? In which case, all you'd have to do is figure it after tax salvage value. So always important to read. And where do you start reading? At the bottom. Start with the question, then work your way backward. Good question. Other questions? Can we just focus on just make it easier? You could, if you wanted to, you could call this OCS plus NCS plus change in networking capital, and then uh, just you'd have to remember that net capital spending outward was negative and inward was positive. Uh, as long as you get the right numbers, it doesn't matter, whatever works for you. The reason I do it this way is because net capital spending, spending is positive when it's money flowing away from you. Um, and it's negative when it's money coming back. So think of net capital spending being like your credit card bill, where when you go out and you buy something, it's a positive number on your credit card bill, and when you get a refund, it's a negative. So if I have a question that says, what's the change in the working capital on your view of the positive 200,000? Yeah, so the change in networking capital in year three is actually negative because it has to go down. Remember, it goes up at the beginning, it has to go down at the end. Now, there is one other tricky kind of problem, and that is where you're putting in a new inventory management system that can actually lower your networking capital at the beginning and then raise it at the end when that project dies. And so in that case, then the sign on the last one would be positive because the networking capital is going back up to its original amount. That's a rare kind of question, and you would not see probably you would not see more than one of those on an exam. Did you have a question? Oh, very good. Okay, anything else? Okay. So that's our example. So what did we learn out of this? First of all, no OCF at time zero. And typically, unless they tell you some other issue, uh, your middle years will all be the same. Now, how do I get NPV out of this? What button should I hit first? 
Yeah, CF. And then I need to say second clear work. What do I put in for CF zero? Yep, negative 2.68 million. Um, negative and or arrow down. Let's see, zero, one. Yep, one, one, nine, three, four, five, oh. Enter, arrow down. What's F, zero, one? Two, because you got two in a row like that. If this were a seven year project, it would be six. Arrow down, C02. Yeah, 1644450. Enter. Now I'm going to hit NPV, and what do they tell us the required rate of return is? 16%. 16. 16. Enter. Arrow down, compute. I'm getting $289,293.48. Would we accept or reject the project? We would accept it. And if there were 100,000 shares outstanding, then each share price should go up by about 29 cents. Because what does MPV represent? It represents the increase in the shareholder wealth as a result of taking on the project. Questions? Yeah. I forgot how you got the, the negative 231,000 at the end of that. In oh, okay. So uh, it was the after tax salvage value. Okay. And all I did was take the market value, which was 300,000 at the end, minus 0 0.23 times 300,000, subtract what was the book value at the end? Zero. Very good. And that is what gave me the 231,000. It's always going to be. Uh, you're always going to eat it out networking capital. So. Yeah, networking capital, when you add all the numbers for networking capital together, it darn well better equals zero. When you add it all together, it better equals zero. Yes? Could you explain again? I know how to get to MPV, I know how to calculate that, but I, and I understand the rule of it's greater than zero, accept it, but I just don't understand how you explain what you just explained. How H share would go up on Oh, okay. So um, let's make the math easier. What if we've got a um, $1 million positive NPV project and you've got 100,000 shares outstanding? Okay, if you take the million divided by the 100,000, it's going to make each share go up by 10 bucks. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this one, the, the math was kind of furry, so it made it difficult. In fact, if I said that what if each, what if there were 10,000 shares outstanding, it'd probably be easier for you to say $2.89 than to see 29 cents. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, this is, uh, I want you guys to jump in there and do your chapter 8 practice and your homework before we get together next time. Because next time, if you've got questions, then we'll need to be able to work through them. I guarantee you at least one of those is going to give you an issue, so you need to look at them and bring that to class. Any questions? Okay. Today, we're going to be walking through the Baldwin Company example. Did everybody get one of these? You didn't get one of these? Okay, so the Baldwin Company example. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read through here, and as we see stuff that we might want to include in the project, we're going to go ahead and put it into the Excel spreadsheet. And here's what you need to know about putting together a good Excel spreadsheet. You want to put all of your inputs up in the upper left hand, and then down below, you want to refer back to that. You want to link to it. And the reason you want to do that is because we call Excel a what if machine. Basically, if I change one of these inputs, what if I could sell the balls for $20 instead of $15? I can put that information in there, and then everything updates. That's the big value of Excel. And in fact, um, if you do this enough, basically 
Uh, you don't have to create a new spreadsheet for each one because you're like, oh yeah, that's just like project whatever. You can just go back and change the inputs and voila, you get a recalculated net present value. So we're going to go through here, we're going to put that stuff up there, and then down below we're going to link back to it. The Baldwin Company makes balls, and they have determined that they, they, they thought maybe there's a market for brightly colored bowling balls. Um, so they're going to do a marketing study, and the marketing study costs $250,000. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in there since they've given us a number. What kind of cost is a marketing study? Sunk. Yeah, it's a sunk cost. Do I include it? No. Yeah, did not include, did not include that. I was teaching this class and I used to have people write essays, little, little short essay question and answers, and someone said, no, I ignore it because it's a suck cost. S-U-C-K. The word is sunk. S-U-N-K. So don't get confused on that. Okay. They are costs that suck because that suck, you can't get them back, right? I agree. In any case, the Baldwin Company is now considering investing in a machine to produce bowling balls. The bowling balls will be manufactured in a building owned by the firm and located near Los Angeles. This building, which is vacant, and the land can be sold for $150,000 after taxes. So, I'm going to say build up. Building, 150, one, two, three. Now, what kind of cost is the building? Opportunity. Yeah, it's an opportunity cost. Because what could we do if we did not do this project? Yeah, we could sell the building, so should we include this? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Now, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, his assumptions are as follows. The cost of the bowling ball machine is 100000 The machine has an estimated market value at the end of five years of $30,000. So, bowling ball machine year zero is 100, one, two, three. And the bowling ball machine Year five is how much? Thirty thousand. Okay. Now, why is that information important? We're going to need that initial cost when we can calculate our depreciation. Why do we care about depreciation? Because of its impact on taxes. Because depreciation is a non-cash expense. And uh, the other reason we care about it is because we're going to use that depreciation to figure out what our book value is going to be at the end. And then we use that along with the market value and the tax rate to figure out the after-tax salvage value. So those things are important. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Okay, now they're starting to talk by per year. And I'm going to go horizontal, and you'll see why here in a bit. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. They say it's a five-year project. And for some reason, it thinks that one is percentage. No idea why. Oh, for shame, he's terribly late. some uh, results here, or uh, some estimates, by years. And we're talking about units of production. Time zero, how many units? There's nothing at time zero. And so these numbers that they give us start at time one. So we got 5,000, we've got 8,000, we've got 12,000, 10,000 and 6,000. 
So do you get the general idea that these balls are going to take off in popularity and then come down? Now, here's what most people don't get, finance people. Who gives you these numbers? Where do these numbers come from, these projected projection, production numbers? Sales team. Say again? Sales team. Yeah, so the, you remember that marketing study that we did? The marketing study is where this information would come from. Now, the question is, do we trust the numbers that we get from marketing? No. So if I were in, and I love it when I do this with my MBA students, because I usually have about a quarter of them are marketing people. And I say, raise your hand if you're an optimist. They raise their hands. And I say, OK, uh, put your hand down if you're not a marketing person. Guess what? It's the same group of people. And hey, what a great way to go through life, right? Except for all their surprises or disappointments. Okay. So back to the story. What does that mean? I used to get numbers from uh, my marketing guy, a guy named Bob Harris. And Bob Harris's numbers were always 20% high. What do you think I did before I threw him into an NPV analysis? Yeah, I multiply them by, or I divide by 1.2, right? Divide by 1.2, and then we're good to go. Now, having someone like Bob that is consistently wrong by the same percentage is lovely, right? I didn't have to know. All I had to do was work with him long enough to figure out what the issue was, right? Now, let's talk about the estimates that we get on other things. What about engineers? Do you think engineers are uh, optimists or pessimists? pessimists? Yeah, they're pessimists. And so the numbers that you get from engineers, which are usually cost numbers, are going to be high, right? Remember I told you already when I would do these projects, I would put in a contingency before I would report the original you know, zero, year zero cash flow to management. So the numbers you get from engineers are going to be pessimistic. What do you think about uh, accountants or accountants? Uh, optimists or pessimists? Pessimist. Yeah. And so when they throw cost numbers at you, they're probably going to be higher than you would have expected, right? And so these are all things to keep in mind. All these numbers are swags. What does swag stand for? Yeah, it's a scientific wild ass guess, but we all have biases, right? I am personally a pessimist because I am both engineer and finance, right? I. If I screwed up as an engineer, do you know what would happen? People would die, right? They, do you think that kind of makes you a little more cautious, a little more pessimistic about it? Yeah. Uh, we, but you need to know these things when you're dealing with people because when they throw their swag at you, what they think is an unbiased swag is actually optimistic if it's coming from marketing people, pessimistic coming from accountants and engineers. Does that make sense? Okay. The price of bowling balls in the first year will be 20 bucks. We're going to assume that we've been given good numbers here, so we're not going to make adjustments. So, bowling ball price. What year is that price for? What do you think? Is it one or zero? One. Yeah, it's one because we're not selling any at time zero. And it's going to be 20 bucks. <coughs> And then they tell us that the price of bowling balls will increase at only 2% per year. So we're going to say BB price growth rate. And that's going to be 0 0.02. And I'm going to go ahead and change that over to a percentage. And then they also tell us inflation is 5%. Now we don't know if we're going to need that number or not, but we'll go ahead and put it in there. Okay. By the way, what does control S do? On the computer, what does it say? Yeah, it saves, right? Um, how often should you save? Yeah, I would do it after every entry if I could remember to do that. Okay, conversely, the plastic used to produce bowling balls is rapidly becoming more expensive. Because of this, production cash outflows 
are expected to grow at 10% per year, and they tell us that the first year production cost will be $10 per unit. And so we've got BB cost year one is going to be $10, and then the BB cost growth rate is going to be, what, 10% is it? 0.10, and I'll get that with the percentage. Okay, let's see. Meadows has determined, based on Baldwin's taxable income, that the appropriate incremental corporate tax rate in the bowling ball project is 34%. So I'm going to say tax rate here, say 0.34. There we go. Now, let's talk about what's the appropriate tax rate. We talk about two tax rates. Uh, we've got our average tax rate, which is our total taxes due divided by taxable income. That's our average tax rate. And then we have our marginal tax rate. Ms. Griffin, do you remember what a marginal tax rate is? No. So let's just start moving down this way. Do you remember what? No. Is that the last one? Like the one you get the highest tax rate for a company? So like. You are, you are so, so close. It's the power of the mustache. I can feel it working for you. <laughs> That's what it is. He shaved. He doesn't know squat, right? Yeah. Okay. So it, you're getting close. It's the tax on yeah, it's the tax rate you're going to pay on the very next dollar you earn, right? It's the tax rate you're going to pay on the very next dollar you earn, and you're right. It's that bracket that you end up in, wherever that bracket is, that's your marginal tax rate. Okay, so this, he's saying, he's looking at the overall taxable income for the firm. He knows what bracket that puts him in, and that's why he comes up with this number. Remember that this project is on top of an otherwise already running profitable firm. And so, uh, just like uh, when I take on additional work here at the university, uh, do I think about my average tax rate or do I think about the tax rate I'm going to have to pay on that extra money? I think about the tax rate I'm going to have to pay on that extra money, right? And if it's high enough, do you think I say, phew, forget it, right? In fact, uh, there's been work that I've turned down here because I'm like, you know, after Uncle Sam and the state of Missouri gets their bite, there's just not going to be enough to make it worth my while to do that. And it can be the same way with these projects. But definitely we need to remember that this is the marginal tax rate because after all, we are looking at the incremental cash flows, right? Those are the ones that are going to be on top of what we're already doing. Go on that. I have a coworker that would talk about how he would refuse to work anything over three hours, but under eight hours of overtime, because that's a, if he was in that range, then he would actually take home less on his paycheck. Interesting. That ha and now I don't know how that would impact his taxes at the end of the year. You wouldn't think that. Yeah, he wouldn't work over. If it, they said those would be like five hours, he goes out more over unless you guarantee me eight. Yeah. Well, and some of that, I would think, is reservation wage. It's like, it's, it's not, you know, it's, uh, people will ask me to come do something, and I'm like, how much? And they, they say, and I'm like, I don't roll out of bed for less than 200 bucks. So, right? you got, you got to make it worth my while. Yeah. So, and I've, I've heard this before, because what happens is, uh, apparently, the software for figuring out how much should be withheld, there, there must be some sort of, of glitch in that because you should not take home less as a result of having worked more. That doesn't make any sense, right? It's not like going into the next tax bracket raises the taxes on all of your earnings, right? Yeah. It's just on the incremental earnings. Okay, so we've got all sorts of information here. I think we actually have enough to get started. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start uh, down here. We're gonna have bowling ball price. And we know, and so remember I'm going to link back to the upper left hand corner. And so I'm going to say equal to, and then I'm going to go up here, and I've got bowling ball price year one. And I'm going to link to that. So now if I 
I want to see what it would be with $18. I can do that, and it changes everything down below. Now, how would I figure out what the bowling ball price is in year two? Multiply the previous year's price by 1.2. Yeah, we're going to multiply the previous year's price times, um, open parentheses, 1 plus, and then our growth rate, which is we're going to link to it once again. Now, here's the issue. If I do this, that's a correct number, right? But then, if I want to copy this thing over, hopefully you guys know, but I, I take this white cross, I put it on that green thing down there, it turns into a black cross, and then I can just drag it over. But there's a problem. It just keeps saying 20.4. Why? You didn't do an absolute sort of thing. Yeah, we didn't do. So I want to continuously refer back to this, uh, actually, this number right here. And what happens is when I do this one, you can see that it's referring to that. But when I go to the next one, it's referring to outer space here. And so that's going to be zero. And so it's not going to change anything. And so what I've got to do then is when I've got this thing selected, I'm going to hit F. F4. F4 pops in those dollar signs. What do the dollar signs do? They fix the location and then we copy it all the way over. And now you notice that it changes every year, it goes up by 2%. Now, why do I use F4 instead of typing the dollar signs? Because I can never remember whether the dollar signs go first or the dollar signs go last. I've got a 50 50 shot and I always get it wrong, right? And so what I do is I just hit the F4. If you use a Mac, you can look it up. It's a different key, right? But you can look it up because that function is available for Mac too. Now the next thing I want to tell you about bowling ball price is we are not going to round that to dollars and cents. We could. It's easy enough to put that function in there. In the end, you're going to see that not rounding our prices and our costs is going to make our NPV, NPV off by about $2. And if you've got an NPV of positive $2, what have I told you you should do? On an exam or quiz, yes. But if you're out there spending $260,000 to kick, hell no, right? Okay. So now I have the units and the price. What can I calculate? Yeah, the annual sales. So we'll just call it, yeah, we'll just call it sales. How am I going to find sales? Yeah. yeah, equal the units times the price. Now, do I have to do any kind of fixed cell references on that? No, I want that stuff to copy over, right? I want that to move as I go. And so there we go. Those are our sales numbers. I'm going to go ahead and save that. Now, let's see what else we've got here. We've got the cost. So I'm going to, and actually, I'm going to go ahead and call it variable cost. I'm going to talk about unit variable cost, and we're going to talk about total variable cost. <laughs> Blesh. Okay, now, <laughs> Blesh, we have, uh, we know that the cost at year one is 10. And then we know that's going to grow. And so we're going to lay, say equal to the previous cell multiplied by 1 plus <laughs> the cost growth rate. Now, what should I do before I close those parentheses? Yeah, I've got to do the dollar signs. I'm going to hit F4, close the parentheses, and there we go. Now, when I copy this over, it's going to go ahead and increase each one by 10%. Okay, now, how can I find my total variable cost? Unit variable times units. Yeah, it's equal to the units times the unit variable cost. I don't have to fix those cell references. I just go ahead and pull that right over. Once again, by the way, this variable cost, did I round it to dollars and cents? No. Is it going to make a big difference in the end? No. Okay, now, there's something else here that I'm going to throw in that is not actually part of this project. And the reason I'm doing it is because I want you to have this, uh, when, you, when we get done here, I'm going to try to post this to Blackboard, and I want you to download it 
and put it on a thumb drive and wear it around your neck for the rest of your life. And here's why. Because when you run into this situation, are you going to remember how to do this stuff? No. You're going to yank that out, you're going to plug it in your lap, ah, ah, okay. And then you're going to email me because you will have forgotten one thing that you can't get from the spreadsheet. And I'll still be here for another 13 and a half years, so feel free. Okay, back to the story. I'm going to go ahead and say fixed cost of zero because we, uh, we don't know anything there. But I'm going to, come on, general. Then I'm going to put in fixed cost here. And I'm going to go ahead and fix that cell reference. By the way, do fixed costs have to be the same every year? No. No. So for instance, think about it being the CEO's salary. The CEO's salary might go up 5, 10, 20 percent per year, right? And so your fixed cost might be different for different years. What, when we say it's a fixed cost, we just mean it doesn't vary with production. It doesn't vary with production. Everything that varies with production is up there in that unit variable cost. Yes? When it comes to MPV, what percentage of change do you want in order to accept? You know, that's when it gets to be kind of hairy, right? That's when you, you look at the, at the numbers and around the table you all have a gut feeling and when you all board out at the same time, run, it's a trap, then you know not to do it. The problem is when you get into arguments. Yes. Uh, of course, you can always stand on your chair and say, always accept all positive MPV projects, but then people are going to give you funny looks. Mm. Yeah, I, I hate to tell you this, but there's no clear-cut answer. Yeah. But I, I have also noticed that unless someone's been doing janky things with the numbers, you hardly ever wind up with ones that are so squeaky that you're like, eh. right? So let's say it's um, let's say it's sixty bucks. Let's see. I wonder if I've even got sixty bucks in my pocket. I don't. I have twenty-two dollars. Uh, but when you start thinking about this is an amount of money I could have in my pocket, do you think your error could be possibly more than the amount of money you've got in your pocket? Potentially. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a really good answer for you. No, you're good. Thanks. Okay, other questions? Okay, now we should be able to figure out Everything, we've got everything to do, earnings before, interest and taxes, except for, we, we don't have interest, we know we're not going to have interest, right, because we don't include cash flows for interest in any capital budgeting project. Uh, but in order to figure the taxes, what have I got to figure first? Okay, uh, in order to figure the taxable income, what have I got to have? Yeah, I've got to have depreciation. Now, we haven't quite gotten to that yet, and we're going to keep moving through the project here, and as we do, we're going to look for these things. So we're going to be skipping around for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and bold these things. Okay, now let's see what else we got here. Networking capital is defined as the difference between current assets and current liabilities. It's sad they felt they had to tell us that, but they tell us that they're expecting a year zero investment in the different items, a working capital of $10,000. <clears> so, uh, remember we've got OCF minus NCS minus uh, change in network capital. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and say control C, and I'm going to paste this here, and then I'm going to do another one down here. This is going to be our networking capital because we want that to be our last thing. And I'm going to call this network capital. And then up here, sir, networking capital year zero, and they say it's ten thousand bucks. Does that sound right? Okay. Now we're going to go down here, and that is just going to be equal to there. After that, what they say is that the networking capital is going to be 10% of sales. So, NWC 
years one through four. Notice it's years one through four, and it's going to be percent sales. And they're telling us it's 10% of sales. Now, let's talk about two things. Number one, why isn't my networking capital in year five also 10 years of sales? 10% of sales. Yeah, because we've got to get this thing back to zero. So networking capital in year five is going to be how much? You're thinking about the change in networking capital. How much is the networking capital itself in year five? So, You're thinking change in networking. Zero. Say again? It's yeah, it's just zero, right? And so when we go through here, in order to get networking capital back to zero, which is what we're planning to do, we're going to do the things that you guys talked about. But what I'm telling you is that percentage of sales for networking capital only happens years one through four. does not happen in year five. So that's the first thing I want to get across. The second thing that I want to get across is why is networking capital a percentage of sales? Any ideas? Let's start with the current assets. What are the current assets we talk about? Cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. Uh, so the, certainly we can see why the accounts receivable and inventory would, be, would fluctuate with sales. Does that make sense? Now let's talk about the accounts payable. That's on the current liability side. It also would fluctuate with sales because I'm buying less raw material when sales go down. I'm buying more raw material when sales go up. Now, sometimes you will see problems and they say, assume that this year's networking capital is equal to 10% of next year's sales. You have to read to figure out what they're asking for. Okay, so we can then come down here and say this is equal to, and I'm going to click on sales multiplied by, and then I'm going to click on this percentage. What button do I have to hit next? Absolute cell reference. Say again? F4. Yeah, I got to do F4 to uh, fix that cell reference. Otherwise, it's going to give us problems. Now, it turns out that 10% of 100,000 is 10,000. Uh, that's a pure coincidence that those are the same number. They don't have to be. In fact, you can see down here that it changes as we go along. Now that we finally figured out how much NWC is in each year, what can we calculate? We'll give you, yeah, the change in networking capital. Now here's something really fun on Excel. If I say insert symbol, symbol, and I select delta, which is the sign for change, and I say close, and then I type networking capital, look what happens to the font. I've been doing this since like 2003, and that, that bug has been here the whole darn time. You would think after all these years that they would have fixed it, but they haven't. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit enter, and then I'm going to go back and say home, and 11, and it puts it back to what it should be. Okay, so uh, change in networking capital at time zero is just equal to that initial 10,000. And then after that, how would I find the change in networking capital for each year? The current year minus the previous year? Yeah, so I'm going to say equal to current year minus previous year. And in this case, it should be zero, and it does show up to be zero. I'm going to copy that on over. And this is what you guys were talking about, that big negative value at the end, that brings it back to zero. In fact, if I say equal to sum, and then I sum all of those changes in networking capital, what should they sum to? Yeah, they should sum to zero. If they don't, you've got a problem. Okay. Wow, we actually have one of the things we're looking for. So there we go. I'm going to go ahead and bold that. Moving on. What's that? 
Oh, it, no, you can hold on to you can have that. Who knows? We may be stuck on this thing next time. We're going to come back and use it again. You too. Okay, back to the story. Um, we've already talked about the bowling ball machine. We've talked about the opportunity cost of not selling the warehouse. So now it looks like we're talking about uh, net capital spending. And that's why I left this up here, is so we can have uh, our net capital spending in a different section. So the things we're going to have net capital spending for, they mentioned the building. It's just the opportunity cost, right? So I'm just going to click on that. And then what is the net capital spending on that building years one through four? Zero. Yeah, there's nothing going on, right? But something happens at year five. The assumption is that all opportunity costs are recovered at the end. If a cost is positive and we recover it, what should the sign be? Negative. negative. So I'm going to say equal to negative, and then I'm just going to click on that. Because after all, if I change it up top, all both of those are going to change. So, so far we've got the building taken care of. What else was there that we would have that would require capital spending? The yeah, the machine. And so I'm going to say BB machine. And that's going to be equal to, I'm going to roll up here, right there. Okay, now, is there any net capital spending on that machine in years one through four? No. Is there a cash flow for year five for that bowling ball machine? Yes. What have we got in year five? Salvage value of 30,000. Yeah, so we got salvage value of 30,000, but uh, we can't take the whole 30,000. We're going to have to figure out the after tax salvage value. And by the way, it's going to be negative because it's money coming back to us on a spending thing. So we know this number, we know this number, we know this number, we don't know this number. So what does that mean we have to calculate in order to get book value? Yeah, we've got to calculate our depreciation. Now, how are we going to do that? I'm going to go ahead and show you the modified accelerated cost recovery system. Go ahead and flip over to table 8.3. And we're going to talk about the modified accelerated cost recovery system. So pre-1986, uh, you basically you would use straight line to zero depreciation for calculating both your, uh, your books and your taxes. By the way, companies have two different sets of books. I know this is going to blow your mind. It sounds like mafia stuff, right? That they would have one they showed to the government and one they showed to everyone else. But according to U.S. law, you can do your financial reporting based on straight line depreciation while using this accelerated depreciation to calculate your taxes. And of course we want to, we want to use accelerated to calculate our taxes because then that reduces our, our current taxes. Why would we choose to use straight line depreciation for our um, financial statements? And the answer is that the accelerated depreciation makes your taxable income lower, therefore it makes your net income lower, so it makes your earnings look worse. And so companies will report straight line for their earnings to try to make it look sexier, and they'll use the accelerated to make the taxes look better. In the end, do you think they're really fooling anyone? No, and they have to report the difference in that deferred taxes thing on the balance sheet. I'm not buying all of it, but you know, whatever the accountants tell us is what we have to live with. Okay, so 1986, uh, we get this modified accelerated cost recovery system. It is a double declining balance with half year convention. That just sounds like total crap. Here's what that means. Take a look, for instance, let's look at the simplest one um, the, for three years. First year, you get 0.3333. That is 33.33% of the historical value of the machine you get to deduct in year one. The next year is 0.4445, which is a larger number. If it were truly double declining balance, the first number would be the highest one, and then it would get lower from there. But because we've got this half year convention, 
That's why that first one is less. Do you guys need to know that for an exam? Absolutely not. Do you need to understand that for why these things are freaky the way they are? Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, that's the first thing I want to point out. Second thing I want to point out about modified accelerated cost recovery system is that uh, if you have a three-year recovery period class, how many of those decimal things are there beneath there? How many years worth of depreciation are there? Four. Now, that's kind of freaky. Um, what about, uh, and by the way, if you add together all those decimals, what do you think you come up with? One, because we are de uh, depreciating this stuff down to zero. And so if you depreciate 100%, that's how you get down to zero. Now, what about under five years? How many years do we see? Six. Uh, and, and you don't have to do the counting to know that for 20 years, how many are there? 21. Now, we've got a five-year project, and so we've been told that it's a five-year recovery period class. By the way, do they have to be the same? Your project could only be three years, and under the law, you might have to use a five-year class. And here's why. If you take a look at page 238, it kind of gives you an idea of what's in the different classes. And remember, all this crap was written back in 1986. And so there's some funkiness there that doesn't take into account modern technology and things like that. So a uh, three-year class includes specialized short-lived uh, property, uh, tractor units, that's like the front end of a, a semi-truck, is uh, depreciated over three years, and racehorses over two years old. Now, I actually had a student that raised racehorses. And she said the reason that it's racehorses over two years old because the horse does not become an asset until after it's two years old. Remember, uh, an asset is something that is expected to produce financial benefit in the future. Um, apparently, we can't say for sure whether a horse is going to be a racehorse until after they're two years old, at which point we figure out, whew, it's a racehorse, now we can depreciate it using a three-year life. Now, let's ask this question. Do you think those diesel trucks that you see on the road really only last three years? I should hope not. Oh my goodness, the, the salvage yards would just be chock full of, of semi-tractors, right? And I see these things out there that are 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, so we know that's not the case. And so if you were doing an NPV analysis on buying a new tractor, meaning the front end of a semi-truck, uh, you might do it over five, ten years, who knows? But the depreciation would all be sooner in time. Does that make sense? So, just because this is a five-year project doesn't necessarily mean that it would be in the five-year Mackers class, but it turns out happily that it is. So, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> By the way, does this start in year zero, this depreciation? No, it starts in year one. So I'm going to say 0 0.200, 0 0 0.32, 0 0.192, 0 0.1152, 0 0.1152, and 0 0.0576. Now, what does that mean? We've got a sixth year of depreciation that we're not going to get. Are we going to be depreciating this all the way down to zero? No, not going to happen. How much is going to be left? Remember we said that those decimals add to 100%? That means that we're going to have 5.76% left of this at the end. What's 5.76% of $100,000? $5,760. And so that's my prediction for what the book value of this thing is going to be at the end. Well, let's go ahead and figure out our depreciation. By the way, do we depreciate opportunity costs? Nope. Let me say that one more time. We do not depreciate opportunity costs. Okay, so, uh, what, now, does that mean there's no depreciation on that building? No, it just means it's not incremental, right? Because that building's a building we already had. If there were depreciation that we were charging against that building, it would already be, be being charged, right? So any 
depreciation on the building is not incremental. That's why we don't do depreciation on opportunity costs. Okay, so no depreciation in year zero. This is just going to be equal to Mackers times the historical cost of the bowling ball machine. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to click right here, and then I'm going to hit F4 to put in my fixed cell references. And then I can pull this thing over, and those are my depreciation amounts. Now, this depreciation, I'm also going to need it up here for my operating cash flow, so I'm going to go ahead and just say Control V. Oh. Sorry. And then I'm going to drag that over. There we go. Okay, now uh, I'm back here to working on my net capital spending. Why did I say I was interested in doing depreciation? What am I trying to calculate? We're trying to get this thing here, and in order to get this thing here, we have to have that. It's the book value of the machine that we're interested in. And so, in the in year uh, zero, the book value is simply the historical costs. And then after that, uh, we could say historical costs minus accumulated depreciation. If I did that, it means I'd have to have another row of calculations there. And I am just terribly lazy, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is say last period's book value minus this period's depreciation. So I'm going to say equal to last period's book value minus this period's depreciation. And then I'm going to drag that over. And as we predicted, the book value at the end is 5,760. Is everything cool there? Okay. Now, let's see. Uh, I think we are finally ready to figure out our after-tax salvage value on this bowling ball machine. First of all, I'm going to say equal to negative because we know that money's coming back to us. Uh, positive spending is money out. Negative spending is money back. This is money back. So I'm going to say equal to negative. We're going to put in an open parentheses here. And then I've got to go find my market value. That is the bowling ball machine in year five minus the tax rate times open parentheses, market value minus the book value, close parentheses, close parentheses. Why did I have to do close parentheses twice there? Yeah, if you've got three of these, you need three of these. If you got two of these, you need two of these. Most common, one of the most common mistakes I see when I used to force students to actually do an Excel thing, and they're like, I don't get it. It's not working. And I'd say, email it to me. And they send it to me. And I'm like, well, you got three of these and you got two of these. So there you go. Okay. Now, do we have enough information to calculate our net capital spend? Yeah, I think we do. All we're going to do is say equal to building plus the machine. I'm going to drag that across, and there we go. That's our net capital spending. I'm going to bolt that, get rid of a couple of those. Okay, so now we have two of the three things that we set out to get. The only thing that we've got left is the operating cash flow, and now we have enough information to figure out our EBIT. How am I going to figure that out? It's just the sales minus the total variable costs minus the fixed costs minus depreciation. Does that look right? Okay, now I'm going to drag that over. That's my EBIT every year. How do I figure my taxes?
Yeah, I'm going to take the EBIT times the tax rate, so I'm going to say equal to EBIT times, and then I'm going to come up here and click on my tax rate. What do I need to do next? Yeah, I've got to hit F4, put those dollar signs in, because I'm going to fix that cell reference to the taxes. I'm going to drag that over, and remember to save. And then, I think I have enough information here to figure out my operating cash flow. Because we said it is just equal to EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes. And as we already knew, OCF in year zero is zero. But there's your OCF for all the other times. This is another one of the things we've been working for. So I'm going to go ahead and bold it too. So now I've got OCF, NCS, and change in networking capital. What can I calculate? Yeah, I can do my CFFA. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and set up a different set of years down here. And I'm going to say CFFA. And it's just going to be equal to OCF minus NCS minus the change in networking capital. I'm getting minus 260,000 there for year zero. I'm going to roll that on over. And if you want to compare this to what is in the uh, example, you can look at page 24. Yeah, on page 234. So we should have. It says total cash flow from investment. You know, that's not looking right. Table 8.4. 8.4. 8.4. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Line 6 of table 8.4. Total cash flow of project. And the numbers should be really, really darn close to ours. Why are they not exactly ours? Number one. Uh, we are doing dollars and cents, they're doing thousands. Number two, remember we didn't round those prices or costs? And that's coming back to, to show here, but it's not really that big of a deal. Now, I'm going to bold this because it's definitely one of the things we're interested in. I'm going to then, we can calculate our NPV, but in order to calculate our NPV, we have to have a rate. Now, do they give us a specific rate? for this project. Now, in fact, they show us, if you look at table 8.4, they show what happened to 4%, 10%, 15%, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so it, it's good that they're showing us that. What we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and set up our rate, starting with that 4%. And then we'll be able to calculate our NPV. There is an NPV function in Excel. I'm going to show you this this time, and I'll show it to you again next time because it bears repeating. If I do the NPV function and I hit the open parentheses, you notice it's asking me for the rate. And I'm going to click on this rate, and then I'm going to hit the comma. Notice now it's asking for value 1. It's not asking for value 0. And here's the problem. The NPV function in Excel does not give you NPV. The NPV function in Excel does not give you NPV. It gives you the present value at time zero of the cash flow starting at time one. Let me say that again. It gives you the present value at time zero of cash flow starting at time one. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these cash flows. And then I've got to add back that initial negative cash flow to really get, that is not a percentage, to get, whoop, there we go, to get NPV. <clears throat> That's a trick. That's tricky. You've got to remember to just add back, and of course that initial one is negative, right? You've got to add back that negative cash flow at the beginning in order to truly get NPV. Now take a look at this. We got 123,643. They got 123,641. What's the difference? 
two months, just like I said it would be. Um, we will start here and finish up next time. Remind me, I'm going to show you how to find those inflection points for IRR before we finish with this example. See you next time.